I'm joined today by Professor Robert Williams, professor in health sciences at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada, and a research coordinator with the Alberta Gambling Research Institute. Uh, it's so great to have you, Professor. You know, we've been talking off and on about gambling and casinos here in Massachusetts, where we are. Uh, there's a casino project quickly moving forward just outside of Boston. But to talk about this more generally, let, let's start sort of at the at the 30,000 foot level. When we think about a casino entering a community, what are some of the common arguments that are made for and against in terms of the impact that a casino will have? Um, the first thing to understand about casinos or gambling more generally is that gambling doesn't create wealth. It involves a transfer of wealth. And so one of the primary determinants of whether a casino is economically beneficial, aside from the social issues, uh, concerns where the money comes from. So if you have a situation where there's a true influx of new wealth, i.e. money coming from outside your community, uh, that, that is a good index that there's genuine economic benefits. And so Las Vegas is the, uh, the best example of this the lion's share of the money that is spent in Las Vegas comes from out-of-state residents. Um, and so this represents a true net economic uh, benefit. Now, in a situation where you create gambling and it's your own citizens that patronize that, then for the most part, that's usually just uh, recirculization of, of existing wealth and often uh, simply cannibalizes other industries. Now, the one important caveat to that, and that's particular in Massachusetts, uh, for example, is that if you have significant outflow of wealth already because your residents are going to a neighboring state to gamble, if you create domestic opportunities that recaptures that, that money, then that also reflects a, a net economic gain. And Professor, this, this analysis is, is only relevant, correct me if I'm wrong, if we're sort of defining economic benefit with, with these sort of arbitrary state or province or city lines, right? I mean, who is to say that we should we should evaluate? Well, it's good for the state, but is it good for the city? Is it good for the surrounding cities or the county? I mean, there's a sort of arbitrary nature to that assessment, isn't there? Uh, very, very much so. There's, so. there's two dimensions to what you said. One is that you got to follow the money. And so in a lot of jurisdictions, you will have a casino and uh, the, the money from the casino may come from, um, often comes from the immediate proximity of the casino. But if the money is then shipped out to some, you know, to the state government uh, in a different part of the state or uh, to a private company in Las Vegas, then uh, essentially what you have is economic loss to the local community that's uh, with the, the beneficiary going uh, being to wherever that money has gone to. And so you have to you have to ex look at this both, both at a micro level and, and a macro level. And the other dimension is that this says nothing about whether there's social costs involved. So that's where uh, I wanted to end. sort of go next, if we can. I mean, one of the one of the main anti casino arguments that you hear is, well, when you have that level of gambling, it brings in what some people call a bad element, a criminal element. It increases the sort of petty crime in the surrounding area because it is known that there are people coming in with money and that they can be open to either scams or actual petty crime, violent crime, theft, etc. What what does data actually tell us about that? The data tends to suggest that there's a little bit of truth to that, but it's it's largely overblown. Hmm. In the public perception, there's a strong connection between crime and gambling, and historically, especially in the United States, that was very true. But um, the operation of gambling has become much more legitimate, and it's it's very difficult for organized crime to be involved in gambling. That, that being said, there's some truth to the fact that uh, gambling attracts loan sharks, it attracts a certain element of, of uh, uh, people uh, who have higher propensities for crime, but generally 
the um, the increase in crime is fairly small, and and um, the main things that tend to increase are um, things like uh, uh, drink driving, that uh, uh, casinos are, are venues that serve additional alcohol and a large number of people consuming alcohol. You actually often have an increase in drunk driving uh, arrests. Yeah, and there's usually uh, a potential for some degree of money laundering as well in casinos and some embezzlement fraud related crime but it's it's mixed and it's not a particularly it's not usually the most uh, significant negative impact of of the introduction of gambling and it's it's much more mixed and modest than a lot of people presume what is in your estimation the most significant negative impact of introducing gambling it's the increase in problem gambling Mm. So basic principle is that whenever a problematic product becomes more available, more people patronize it. And with more people patronizing it, that small percentage of people have problems with the product uh, increase. And so problem gambling and the associated indices, i.e. personal bankruptcy, um, uh, suicide attempts, uh, uh, domestic problems, work problems, uh, um, the occasional uh, case of embezzlement, those all uh, significantly increase after the introduction of, of gambling. Now, the caveat to that is that it depends on how new the populace is to, to gambling. If they've had gambling around for many, many years, in all the different forms, then simply introducing yet another casino in a place that already has casinos will have a fairly minor uh, increase in problem gambling. But if it's a uh, jurisdiction that's never had this particular form of gambling before, you often see a significant increase in, in problem gambling. What do studies tell us about uh, how profitable problem gambling is for casinos. You see the big casinos do a lot of public relations around, uh, you know, you have to gamble responsibly, providing numbers to gamblers, anonymous type helplines and services, and really trying to make it a point that they're there for people to have fun, but they want to prevent problem gambling. Don't most studies suggest that actually disproportionate casino winnings are from problem gamblers? Yes, definitely. Um, this is very important for people to know that casinos and governments who introduce gambling are always very quick to point out the, the good that comes out of gambling, the additional jobs or the, uh, being able to uh, mitigate tax increases or uh, f further education funds. But equally important is where the money comes from. And so the evidence is fairly unambiguous that a substantial portion of gambling revenue, roughly, depending on the jurisdiction, the time period between 15 and 50 percent of all gambling revenue comes from that one to three percent of the populace who are problem gamblers. And that proportion tends to be higher for casinos and all continuous forms of gambling like, like slot machines or video lottery terminals. So yeah, that is a significant social uh, issue about the disproportionate contribution of uh, a, a small, vulnerable segment of the population. How are we defining a problem gambler? Problem gambler is defined by two elements. One is that there's impaired control over one's gambling. A um, person has difficulty restraining themselves from gambling, even though they make commitments to um, to do so. So impaired control, not loss control. It's analogous to if um, smokers who are trying to quit smoking. There are times where you're able to rein that in. It's just that it's a very difficult thing to do and mm -hmm. you, you lose control periodically. So impaired control is the first element. And the second is that significant negative consequences deriving from that impaired control. And that could be financial problems, be relationship problems, could be mental health problems, but any significant problem in your life deriving from that impaired control. And so there's standardized instruments used to assess this. And roughly <clears throat> between one and three percent, at least in North America, the population meets those criteria. 
Last thing I want to touch on, and you sort of mentioned this a little bit, two of the uh, of the pro casino arguments that are often made, and I want to get your take on them. One is the casino itself provides jobs. In the cases of really big casinos, we're talking about a lot of jobs, thousands, tens of thousands even. Uh, and the other argument is this is also good for surrounding businesses, restaurants that are not part of these casino complexes, but nearby or uh, hotels that are not part of the casino complex, but nearby. What can you tell us about that? It gets back to the first point I made that the true net benefits um, uh, are dependent on where the money's coming from. So if you've created a, a resort casino and you're drawing money from outside the community and hopefully even outside the state, then the money coming in is a net benefit and that that goes, you have a net increase of employment uh, and that uh, the spin-off benefits to hotels and gas stations and, and various industries. And so there's a true net increase in employment and a true net increase in business starts and business revenues of complementary industries. However, in a situation where you've created a casino and the patronage is all from the state or all from the local community, then all that happens is cannibalization of other industries. And so all the employment gains of that casino come at the expense of loss of employment in other usually hospitality type industries. And all of the new revenues in these uh, associated hotels, et cetera, come at the expense of loss of revenue in other often entertainment or hospitality type industries. All right. Professor Robert Williams from the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada, also from the Alberta Gambling Research Institute. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. More than welcome.